Okay, we're rolling. All right, this is an interview at the Avila Center a Senior Residence at Albany, New York. It is the 27th of March, 2006, approximately 10 a.m. Interviewers are Wayne Clark and Mike Russert. Could you give me your full name, date of birth, and place of birth, please? Nancy M. Mary Hoppensperger. I was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota in 9-8-26. What was your educational background prior to entering service? Graduate, Russell Sage College, class in 1948. Um, why did you decide to go into the service? Couldn't get in the second war because I was too young and they didn't take women until age 21. And uh, so my brother served in the South Pacific as a sea marine and uh, fortunately survived. And so I always thought, well, maybe I'd like to join the military. And so in 1951, I went into the Army. Okay, why did you pick the Army? Well, because the Navy wouldn't take me because I wore glasses. I didn't have 20-20 vision, and the Navy would not pick you, or would the Marines take you if you didn't have 20-20 vision. Okay. All right, where did you go for basic training? Uh, Fort Lee, Virginia. Now, um, Francis was telling us about uniform problems and so on. When she went in, did you have any problems with that? Uh, no, by that time, of course, this is in 51, they had uniforms for women. They did not have fatigues or any combat gear for women because women were not supposed to uh, be exposed to any combat situation. So all we did have was uh, uh, Class A and uh, working uniforms, that's all. Mm -hmm. Being that uh, the, the Army was gearing up for the Korean War, did you notice any kind of shortages at all? Well, the Korean War was already on, and uh, there were uh, no shortages. We didn't have any women in Korea mm -hmm. at that time. Uh, we had them in support in, uh, in Japan, uh, but that was all. But there was no shortage of uniforms as existed mm -hmm. when, let's see, in 1973, uh, when women were integrated into the military, they required combat gear, required fatigues, required this type of thing. Mm -hmm. And the same issues adhered when Francis went in, where they didn't have any uniforms. They had to wear men's, in fact, I had to buy men's fatigues. Mm -hmm. And have them tailored so as they fit me. Not the, not the regular, you know, skirt, jacket, and so forth, right. but fatigues. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. How long were you at, at Fort Lee? I was there, uh, oh, about between six and seven months. The training was seven months. I mean six months, I'm sorry. So you had advanced training there? Yes. Well, we had what they call officer basic training. Oh, okay. I was a direct commission second lieutenant. What were uh, what was life like at, at Fort Lee? Well, in the first place, they recalled all people uh, to active duty women from the Second War who remained in the reserve. Mm -hmm. They recalled them all to active duty, and the platoon uh, officers were all Second World War veterans. We called to active duty to uh, train the troops that were being uh, uh, who had enlisted both officer and enlisted, and so they had two battalions, quite a large organization. And But most of them were manned by women who served in the Second War, who were with Francis uh, in the Second War, right? Kay Royster and all the rest yeah, of them. Yeah, all the rest of them. They were World War II. Because we didn't have any. It was uh, the, the, the military had shrunk back, so as you mm -hmm. know, after the World War II, all the men reserve were also recalled, incidentally, as an aside to you. Mm -hmm. So if you were in the Army Reserve, National Guard, or whatever it is, uh, you were recalled to active duty mm -hmm. for the Korean War, not incident, war. Mm -hmm. 
Where did you go after Fort Lee? I went to uh, Fort Dix. But that's when the 9th Infantry Division was stationed at Fort Dix. You probably don't remember that, but it was the 9th Infantry Division that was stationed at Fort Dix. And I took over as executive officer of a WAC detachment. They were the, the 9th uh, Infantry Division uh, Schools Regiment, trained internally within the division, cooks and bakers, wire, Kirk, uh, just a supply, all that type of thing. And so they called it the school regiment. And I was the executive officer of the WAC detachment for clerks. And so we had about 250 women, and they would go along with, uh, uh, not to the same schools as the men, but in any case, uh, it was the school's regiment, and their training was AIT, is what we call it today, right. was uh, eight weeks. And they moved in and out. We had permit party people too, but only to take care of uh, the company and uh, some assignments within the Ninth Division itself. As an officer, what were your barracks or your living quarters? Almost like? as bad as theirs, except I think we had a small kitchen for all the people who lived in. So the you barracks. lived in a barracks, then? Yes, mm -hmm. one uh, one room, bed, uh, chair, uh, small table. And uh, I guess that was about it. Did you have the option of uh, on post no. housing? Or? No, okay. never. Single people were not given those. We couldn't even uh, we couldn't even go to the commissary. Single people were prohibited from going to the commissary. Really? Oh yes. Mm -hmm. They let us go to the PX. I thought mm -hmm. that was nice. But and that went on for let's see. Up and through the time we was at Fort Bragg, they never permitted single men or women, it's not just women, uh -huh. men or women to go to the commissaries. Okay. That's interesting, I've never yes. heard that before. No, that's right. Most people didn't know it, you see. Mm -hmm. Now if you were family or a wife or uh, a man and you were married, then you could go to the commissary. Mm -hmm. That's withstanding the fact that we had to inventory the commissary. If you've ever inventoried a uh, deep freeze and pushing the uh, hog sides and beef sides around, you'd know what I'm talking about. <laughs> That's one of my duties as a uh, second lieutenant. What were some of your other duties as uh, an officer? Well, mostly uh, for the first, oh, I'd say the first, what, eight years I was with WAC detachments. Okay. I was either the executive officer or the commander. After those eight years, where did you go? Well, let me see, I'd have to compute that back. Uh, I went from uh, Fort Dix to Fort Bragg, uh, where I took over as commanding officer. And then from Fort Bragg, I went to where? Oh. I went to Japan, Yokohama, Japan, and there where I was the education officer. But I went there on my request, it was during Korea. We lived in, appropriately enough, a place called Korean Courts. <laughs> and uh, I asked for the assignment because my identical twin sister was a married old nun stationed in Kyoto, Japan. So they afforded me the opportunity to go over, mm -hmm. as they always try to do, the Army did, for both enlisted and officer, uh, to be near where a point is they would like to be because of family or mm -hmm. whatever have you. So that's where I went from Fort Bragg. Did you I, get to visit her very? Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. I used to use, I was supposed to be I.D. White, say, General White, and I didn't want the job. So then they, they assigned me as education officer. But nevertheless, I used <coughs> their helicopters to fly up to Kyoto. <laughs> Don't put that down. <laughs> and that's where my sister was. And what was, she, what was her assignment? Well, she was an, a married old sister. Oh, OK. You said that. Sister. Okay. She didn't have an assignment. Yeah, I, 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 um, 
<laughs> the church in the well, the church assigned her over there. Yes, right? yes. Well, she took. Yeah. Uh, she's uh, fluent. Read, write, speaks Japanese fluently. Reads, writes, and speaks German fluently. So she's pretty no, smart. Is your sister still living? Oh yes, yeah. she lives here in Albany. Mm -hmm. She was the uh, assistant uh, superintendent of the Albany school system. After Mad Vatican II, she uh, got out of the convent and went into teaching. Um, how long were you in Japan? I was there a little over two years. Where did you go from there? I went to Fort McClellan, Alabama as company commander of a basic company. Now what rank were you at that point? I was a captain. Okay. Under Eisenhower we were in grade for five years. Hmm. And when he was president, that is to say. Mm -hmm. I'd never vote for a military man to be president in my whole life. But basically it was because of the drawdown of the forces, mm -hmm. you know, after Korea, after World War II. So everybody was in the same boat, not just myself. Mm -hmm. So your ranks were frozen? Frozen, that's years. right. For enlisted <coughs> as well. Mm -hmm. What were your duties in, in at McClellan? I was a company commander of a basic company. Mm -hmm. Company C, the best company in basic <laughs> trade. Now what does that mean, a basic company? Well, you had, uh, well, for training, basic training. Mm -hmm. All okay. right, now, basic training is eight weeks. And so every eight weeks, you got a new crew in. The size of the company is about 250 women, about 25 NCOs. And your job was to nurse maid them, train them, and uh, drill, military justice, military uh, courtesies, uh, et cetera. Now, and at that point, there were regular WAC drill sergeants? Yes, absolutely. It was all female. Mm -hmm. And that was our job. And then we'd graduate them. They'd go to AIT, Advanced Individual Training, wherever it was they were going, whether it was air control or whether, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. Then we get a new bunch in and train them for eight weeks and send them on their way. Now, clerical school at that time was located right on Fort McClellan. So if they were to be assigned to clerical type work, whether it be stenography or whatever have you, uh, they would just move from one barracks to the other mm -hmm. right on Fort McClellan. So, okay. that's what I did at McClellan. Push them, shove them. Well, you know, basic training. Mm -hmm. Sure. Where did you go after McClellan? Fort McClellan. I can't even say Fort That's McClellan. Okay. I moved from Fort McClellan to. Oh, I went to Fort Hamilton, where I met the future sergeant major. Mm -hmm. And I stayed there, what, two years? Two, two, and, a half two, years. two and a half years as a company commander. And Fort Hamilton, in case you don't know, it's in Brooklyn, New York. Yes. Uh, then when I left there, I went to the WAC Advanced Course back at Fort McClellan. And then when I left Fort McClellan, <laughs> there's where I'm caught. Did I go to 5th Army Headquarters or Army Material Command? I think it was, no, it wasn't 5th Army. No, it was AMC, I think. Well, I went to Army Material, Army Material Command Headquarters, located at, um, what's that airport? What? National Airport, what, I don't know what they call it today, in D.C., National Airport. That's where the headquarters was, Army Material Command Headquarters. And uh, had to do with Inspector General duties. Uh, where they flew all over the world to do the inspections of the various units and organizations of the United States Army to determine whether or not they were doing their job. Mm -hmm. And I did not, well, I shouldn't say that. Did I go out on any inspections? No. I was a stay-at-home guy who uh, wrote all the inspection reports and sent them up the chain of command so everybody could cry. And uh, so that, in point of fact, is... is what I did at that time. Were there a lot of problems associated with the... Uh, well, 
well, you with can the always inspection. Well, yes, you, but you can always find problems. I can tell you right now, right in here, the problems. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> and if you're looking, and yeah, and we had uh, the inspection team was comprised of uh, experts, ordnance, quartermaster, transportation, military justice, and they were all experts in their field. They were all officers. Mm -hmm. And uh, they would go to the various installations to determine whether or not they were following regulations, this type of thing. Uh -huh. And while there weren't any glaring things, still in all, nobody's ever perfect. Mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, we did hit some things that were not quite kosher, you know. Not I, uh -huh. yes, yes. the 15 inspectors we had. Uh -huh. And it, the team was headed up by... Uh, uh, bird colonel, and the others were all lieutenant colonels. I was a major. I was the scrubbing woman. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> now, once the uh, they did away with the WAC Corps, what was the the mood and the feeling like? Was was there a, a lot of apprehension about you know being basically like an army of one? Oh, uh, well, that didn't happen until, uh, what was that, 1973? When it, it was before I retired, I know. And what year when did you retire? No, it wasn't before you retired, was it? No, because I was in the Pentagon at the time, because General Abrams had me up in his office. Mm -hmm. So that had to be, uh, when, when was I in the Pentagon? 70s. Early 70s, or late 70s. You're right, that could have been it. Yeah, it could have been. Could have been. Uh, but it would have been 69, 68, 69, 70 time frame is when they decided to integrate the women and not make them a separate branch. Right. We were always integrated, don't misunderstand me. Mm -hmm. We were regular army or uh, ASU, A, but to integrate them right in, you know, occurred at that time frame. They weren't seg segregated anymore. Right. And General Abrams called me, or he didn't call me for crying out loud. His, his administrative officer called me. I was sitting on a promotion board at the time. And they got hold of the general who was running the promotion board to report to General Abrams. And so I did. And thinking, I what, examining my conscience to see what they catch wrong? me in. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good though. Anyway, I went up there and and he asked me my opinion of what we could expect as a result of integration. So I told him. I said, uh, I don't think it's, I, I think it's okay to do this, but you must remember that when, and I was sitting on a promotion board from, uh, from what, from, from Major Lieutenant Colonel, I think I was sitting on that board. Anyway, that is to review all the records of those people qualified for possible promotion. And I said, having just sat on this board for four weeks, I said, I can tell you right now, no, woman's record can any man of shape or form compare it to a male record. Mm -hmm. Same grade, same time in service. Because they were never given the opportunity to perform the tasks that the men have, excluding, of course, combat. So therefore, if we are going to do this, strict rules must be provided to the members of the promotion boards to determine that they are not done illy by not having attended all the advanced classes. For God's sake, I was the first woman who went to Commander General Staff College. Okay? So therefore, how could you compare that to a man who's already gone to... Uh, the advanced class, the special classes, the command general staff college, the war colleges, there's no competition. So, you're going to 
weigh my file and record to say yours, it's a no show. So therefore, what it could do is inhibit the possibility of any woman being promoted henceforth. Because mm -hmm. they're not competitive. They're not parallel. So, and he was, an, uh, uh, an, as an aside, he was a lovely man, that General Abrams. I mean, to tell you, he was a sweetheart. Real sweetheart. He was the son of a gun, though. Oh, boy. <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> but he was a terrific guy, you know, personality-wise. And yes, he was a terror, but he's a disciplinarian. Yes, no, or I don't know, and I'll find out, is what he expected from you. That's not hard. Mm -hmm. It's the wishy-washy, mealy-mouth, pussy-foot, and guys that say, well, or women for that matter. Never than the yes, no, I don't know, but I'll furnish the information for you. What's so hard about that? Because they didn't want to look like idiots is the reason. Mm -hmm. I'd rather look like an idiot and say, I don't know, but I'll find out. So you were had various assignments going up through the Pentagon, and you did say you were in Vietnam also. Yes, I was there uh, at that time. I was uh, I was stationed in Hawaii, and I was uh, U.S. Army Pacific, and uh, General what's that guy's name? We don't like Senator from Arizona. Oh. <laughs> uh, his father was commanding commanding general of U.S. Army Pacific. What's his name? He's a senator. I can see him. Hmm. Anyway, no, you wouldn't know, but I just came from Arizona, so that's how come I know him. Yeah, McCain. John McCain. Oh, yeah, okay. His father was, and he was still in prison in Vietnam, John McCain, Jr. His father was uh, commanding general of the U.S. Army Pacific. Anyway, I was there at that staff, and I was with the inspector general's team. And so I traveled so far east on inspection teams, including Vietnam, and that's how I got to Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And one of my funniest moments there, if one could consider anything funny, was uh, uh, my, one of my areas of interest, that is to say that I inspected, was the chaplain's organization to be sure that they were getting all the necessary materials and, and uh, so forth. Anyway, the chaplain's assistant was a 26-year-old young man, very bright, college graduate, blah, 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 blah. And so he came in and he was complaining. He said, I'm 27 years old, I'm a, a chaplain's assistant, and I can't buy any liquor. Imagine that. Because there was a prohibition of any enlisted man in grade, whatever it was, and below. He could Before buy. and below, I think it was. Uh, so boy, did I lambast that. I wrote that up real strong. Because that's just unconscious. Unconscious. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're talking an 18-year-old who can't drink anyway, that's one thing. Yeah. But you don't take a mature man and say, listen, now you have to play like the little guys, you know, the young guys, I mean. So, but I wrote down. Consideration should be given to the circumstances of the individual. And they changed it eventually. Mm -hmm. So that's how I got to Vietnam. When were you in Vietnam? Mm -hmm. Approximately. Well, when I fill out this form, I'll tell you, I think yeah, okay. it was in 60, 68 or 69. And then after I left Hawaii, I went to where? Oh, I went to the Pentagon for three years. I was congressional liaison officer for uh, armed, uh, assistant chief of staff for force development which entailed my being a horse holder for all the two and three star generals in that organization when they appeared before Congress, the Senate Armed Services Committee, the House Armed Services Committee, the Appropriations Committees in defending their budgets. 
I was the guy holding the black book in the back of the channels. Turning pages to find the answer. Handing it to him. That was my duty in the Pentagon. Wonderful assignment, best assignment I ever had. Best assignment. We were the cream of the crop, upper third or upper quarter, I should say, of the military assigned to the Pentagon, as they are with enlisted. So it's the cream of the crop. Mm -hmm. And uh, cooperation. Uh, one day I was uh, putting a congressional record together, which entailed a little bit of doing. I had two secretaries, and I was on the E wing. In fact, of the matter is, my office was way, right where that plane hit at 9 11. That's where my office was. Third floor, E wing. That's the general's wing. They get the windows mm -hmm. in the E wing. Us hole holders got the other side of the aisle, which is the inner part of it, but that's where my office was. And where it hit was right where we would have been. I've thought of that many times. Uh, anyway, they'd walk up to E Ring to go to their offices, you know, sec death and all the rest of it. They used to stop by and stick their head in. Now, these are two and three star generals, okay? I'm still, oh, now I'm a lieutenant colonel. And they stick their head in and say, can we help you? And one of the things was to, uh, um, to put, I had a long table, and we had to take each page and put it together, and, uh -huh. and so forth. And there they were, we all marching in step, moving, putting this stuff together. So, anybody who tells you, they beat me to work, and I got there at 6 o'clock. They got there between 4 and 5. I left about 7 o'clock at night. They never left until about 10 or 11. Anybody ever tell you that generals are just prima donnas and they don't work? I got information for that. Don't say it in my presence, because maybe you'll have one rotten apple out of the whole bunch. But they're workaholics. They couldn't be otherwise, or they couldn't hold a job. But it was a wonderful assignment. I met some wonderful people, all future generals of the Army. <laughs> That's right. Because they were all in the various branches in the Pentagon. Is that not right, Francis? Yes. So you get to know all these people, and then when you go out for assignment, other assignments, there you are. You They're know, afraid of you. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> oh. <laughs> was that your last assignment? Or? No. I le uh, left, left there and went to Germany. And I was in Würzburg, Germany. And I was the first woman ever to take command of a male organization, which comprised about maybe two, 3,000 people. A budget of extraordinary amounts. It was with the 3rd Infantry Division. Uh, the Marne Division, as you might recognize during the Second War. And uh, we were support of the 3rd Infantry Division, which con consisted of three different concerns, you know. And uh, we provided engineering, military police, uh, quartermaster, uh, commissary, PX, education for the dependents and so forth. How many and years total did you have? What, there? I had about two and a half years. I was promoted to 06, mm -hmm. bird colonel at that time. About the first six months I was there, I guess, I was promoted to 06. It was an 06 slot anyway. Yeah, that was, you said Wurzburg? Which, yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was at Beeble Star. Yes, field. yes, mm -hmm. absolutely right, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And we had Kitsigan and uh, all the rest of them. Mm -hmm. uh, right in the 3rd Infantry Division area. And you're talking about rubble. Um, one of our areas where we had warehousing, they still had not repaired. And uh, it was just a shambles uh, as a result. But you see, Wittsburg was bombed by the British and Americans because one of the bombers, our bombers, went down and uh, the German soldiers shot them all. So they mounted a big attack on Woodsburg, air attack, demolished the city. Mm -hmm. And why? Woodsburg is a college town 
uh, you might look at it as an, uh, the cathedrals, opera, uh, higher education, uh, this kind of thing. They had, other than the uh, they they had the uh, airfield there. Uh, it was for the Luftwaffe. Luftwaffe. The Luftwaffe, and we took over their concern, mm -hmm. and uh, so that's all they had there was the Luftwaffe, and uh, so really they had no munition, no manufacturing, no. There wasn't a tactical, mm -hmm. but this is in preparation for having killed our people without taking them prisoner. So it was quite a, and they put it back together. They had old pictures, so old Thomas, old Germans, Germany's on. And brick by brick from the pictures, they would be built. The First World War bullet holes were put in as they constructed the agents. It's a beautiful city. It's, isn't it beautiful? It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Now, uh, um, did you retire after your no. time there, or did you no. go somewhere else? Okay. You're pushing me out too fast. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. I went from there to, uh, well, at that time, you see, they were changing our MOSs. Now, what is an MOS? That's your specialty, all right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, where before we were branch WAC, we could be, uh, we could uh, be, say, in the Adjutant General Corps, but we couldn't be a part of it. We could wear their brass and so forth, but we, our basic branch was WAC. Well, they changed that. And so, they called me over there in Germany and said, now listen, you got to change your branch because the WAC is no longer in effect. I said, oh, okay. So then the Provost Marshal of the Army, who I knew in the Pentagon as a bird colonel, called me personally and said, Nancy, I want you to consider be joining the military police. And I said, what else you got to offer me, General? <laughs> I'm not offering you anything. I just want to get you in our military police. So I said, okay, put me down for military police branch. So then I changed from uh, WAC branch to military police. Then when I left Europe, I took over as provost marshal at Fort Knox, Kentucky. Now the general there was a personal friend of mine out of the Pentagon. He was a two-star, subsequently he got promoted to four. Uh, but he was the CG there, and so I took over as provost marshal. And from there then I retired. How were you accepted Oops. by the... Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. oh, they, what would they do with me? Yeah. The okay. basis, outgoing, charming. <laughs> no, <I'm just> kidding. <laughs> no, they were very receptive, very receptive. How many years uh, total service? 27 today? or 28. Wow, that's quite a career. Yeah. Well, I was supposed to take over the CID command uh, in San Francisco, which is everything out to the islands and back to the Mississippi. But I'd already put so much time in. I'd been the first woman to do so much. I said, no more, you burn me out. Mm -hmm. So I retired. And then uh, Chief of Staff of the Army, Shai Myers, had been my division commander with the 3rd Infantry Division. And he wanted me to come up to his office. I said, no, I've had it. And furthermore, I wouldn't do another tour of duty with you. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I did too say that. He's a nice friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do after you left the service? Did you Absolutely nothing. I had, oh well, I had my home constructed in uh, Sierra Vista, Arizona, next to Fort Huachuca. Uh, well, for the last six months before I retired. And so it's, it was about an acre and a third. And I had the home built and so forth. And so when I uh, retired, I just drove out to Arizona. Mm -hmm. And they did nothing else but landscaping, and uh, I'm an outdoor person, landscaping and planning and so forth for the next years. Then my best friend, who was World War II, died of cancer. She was my mentor over the years. And uh, she died. And so I just stayed on there. 
and that's two pigs, 3,200 square foot home with a swimming pool and this Arizona room with a uh, hot tub and so forth, too big. Getting older. Can't stay up with it. Mm -hmm. So you sold it? And right. And it's, I've just been here a year, a year, a year and several months. Mm -hmm. And my brother had triple bypass. He's a year and a half older than we are. And my sister is a cancer patient. So it was apropos that I come home to, to if unnecessary, I could help out. Mm -hmm. How do you think that sir, your time in service changed or had an effect on your life? Well, at a very young age, it gave me a great deal of responsibility. And of course, I never turned away from responsibility to begin with. <clears throat> I was a disciplined person from kindergarten right on up. I come from a very strict German family on both sides. So I learned discipline at the home. I went to all Catholic schools. VI, you remember VI, and so forth, and and so I was not, uh, and not, I've been exposed to too many years. I went to Russell Sage, at which time we couldn't wear slacks on the street. We had bed checks. Uh, we went to uh, camp for the month of uh, May or June it was, and uh, there we stood in line and saluted the flag and all the rest of this stuff. And it was very disciplined environment mm -hmm. all the way from the kid. Yeah. So I just slipped into the military routine and had a ball. Had a ball. Do you miss it? Well, mm -hmm. yes, I do. I, I miss uh, the camaraderie and uh, I miss, uh, I don't know, the challenge of it all. Every duty assignment was different, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you learn so many things. You know, when I was Congressional liaison is how I knew about the Chinooks and so forth. One of my jobs was supporting director of aviation. So I had to learn all that, you know, so I could pull the right crib sheet out, you know, mm -hmm. and so forth. And the same with uh, artillery, whether it be SAM missile or whatever have you. And the tanks, I had the pleasure of riding in the Leopold tank, which is the Germans' newest tank as versus the Abrams tank when I was in Germany. And I want you to know that is a wow of an experience. I went down the tank course with them. Of course, I wasn't driving, you understand. Uh, they were doing, well, we were, uh, we were uh, sister organizations is how I got to do that. I was up the tour standing up and almost got thrown out several times because the tank is just And uh, so, uh, I don't know, I've talked too much. I, I can tell you experiences you'd never believe. But it was all fun. And it was hard, grueling work. I can't remember when I ever got home for one time. I used to get home in the Pentagon at nine. Sometimes, and then the funniest thing was uh, in the Pentagon they had duty rosters for every director, okay? And whether that be personnel or, or uh, operations or whatever it is. And you had the man in the war room. All right? Now, the war room is four floors, uh, four floor, uh, floors below in the basement. That is something. If you ever saw any of these James Bonds things where they have things coming up on the, the video and the, uh, that is an experience in itself. Anyway, I was. I pulled the duty for my unit, which was a huge unit, uh, Acts 4, Assistant Chief of Staff of Force Development. We had five generals, two stars, never mind all the rest of us creepy crawlies running around. Anyway, they had us on that, and I was a lieutenant colonel at the time. So I reported to the war room why well, you had to have special passes and everything, but I represented my three-star general, you see. Well, they didn't have any instruction. Well, I wasn't alone, you see, because there were other guys milling around saying, what are we supposed to do? <laughs> I said, walk in and look smart. <laughs> so we, <laughs> we had to go through three checkpoints, you know, and all the rest of it. We get in there. And, uh, and they had signs where you were supposed to sit, of course. You know. And you're there for the purpose of, should some incident occur, that in any manner, shape, or form, 
would impact upon your general's area of interest that could, you could immediately call the member of his staff that would be responsible to respond to that, which is the name of that game. <coughs> and <coughs> in the meanwhile, it was Christmas Eve, and here we all stuck in this in this world. And so, uh, I'm not going to be able to remember his name, General Stowell. He was a. Uh, uh, he was what we called DESOPS, Director of Operations, you know. And that was part of his bailiwick and his responsibility. Anyway, so here it is, just about 11.30 at night, you know, and he'd reported for duty about 1,700. And uh, so here comes, uh, no, I forgot his name again, General. Stillwell. Here comes General Stillwell uh, with his wife. Came in and walked around the war room and wished everybody a Merry Christmas. You want good guys? Chum up with the general. Because they're thoughtful, considered, and so forth. Anyway, so I'll never forget that. And neither will any of us that were down there. <coughs> and it made the whole ordeal great. Well, we got off duty the next day, about 0900, I think it was. And, but I'll never forget that. Nor would any, like Patton was the same way, all right? Nobody will ever forget Patton, who served with him. Say what you will about the man, I'll tell you, had charisma. And, but this is an aside to all this, you know? Mm -hmm. But anyway. Okay, well, thank you very much for your interview. You're welcome, I'm sure, and I'm sorry to take up so much of your